Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Where I see a lot of uh, companies and, and salespeople making mistakes when they approach prospecting is they either take one of two approaches. They either say, hey, I'm going to take the murder by numbers approach and it's all about the number of contacts on my email list and I'm going to start cold emailing and sending a ton of outreach. And they'll send thousands of unpersonalized messages to people. And most of the responses they get back from people are telling them to either F off or it's people that are interested <laughs> that are not a great fit. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most listened to B2B sales show. If you haven't already, make sure to click subscribe. And with that, let's meet today's guest. Uh, my name is Jason. I run a company called Blissful Prospecting with my wife, Sarah. And we help small and mid-sized business-to-business companies reduce the stress from prospecting by doing it for them. On this episode of the show with Jason, we're diving into how you can build a predictable sales pipeline. Predictable is the most important word in that sentence. That's something that we all want, right? Clearly, but it's something that is very difficult seemingly to achieve. Jason drills it all down into the most basic principles and makes it super easy to follow. And so with that, let's jump into the conversation. I think we'll get into many things today, but I want to start the conversation with asking you about predictability within our sales pipelines. Is it possible, not necessarily in an ideal world, but in in the reality that we all live in, is it possible to have a predictable sales pipeline in B2B sales? Because I've never managed this before. And I mean, if it is possible, I'm intrigued to kind of learn how to do it. Yes, it's definitely possible. And I think that where you have to kind of step back and think about and where I see a lot of uh, companies and, and salespeople making mistakes when they approach prospecting is they either take one of two approaches. They either say, hey, I'm going to take the murder by numbers approach and it's all about the number of contacts on my email list and I'm going to start cold emailing and sending a ton of outreach and they'll send thousands of unpersonalized messages to people and most of the responses they get back from people are telling them to either F off <laughs> or it's people that are interested <laughs> that are not a great fit. Or what I see people doing is putting so much thought into what the messaging should be and like who they're going to reach out to that there's just no volume at, at all. So there is a certain volume play to this. But I think a really good place to get started, and for whatever reason, even large companies don't really think about this, is what's your ideal client profile? And it, it can't be we're a solution that's industry agnostic. That's one of my biggest pet peeves is is when companies say that. Just because your solution would work across multiple industries doesn't mean that you should segment your outreach like that. So for example, um, like we sell prospecting services, right? Uh, A lot of companies need prospecting. And if we just said, hey, if you sell a business to business service, uh, we can work with you. That's much less appealing than if we're like, if, so, for example, nonprofits are an ideal client profile of ours. If we're like, hey, nonprofits uh, have a really big challenge with re- being tapped on resources, and they typically don't have business development people that are actively building partnerships. So where we can kind of come in is help them identify what their dream partners look like and help them create a little bit more predictability in that partnership pipeline so that they can increase their impact. So they use words like impact versus revenue. They use words like partner instead of client. So if you could really dig down that deep and look at all the clients you've worked with, like in 2018 and up to this point, and just look for some similarities. Who did I like working with? Who had the shortest sales cycle? So in other words, who is the easiest to sell that really understood what we do and why it's valuable to them? And most importantly, Who's uh, most profitable for you as 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 a as a uh, a service or product provider, and then who seems to get the most value? What are the repeat customers? If you take that list, you can segment that into the ideal client profiles. You'll start seeing patterns in industry, employee count, specific things you might identify on their website, for example, specific technology they might use on their website. And I think that that's to answer your question on the predictability part, you got to take the time to really understand who your customer is so that you can craft the the right messaging and reach out to the right people. Once you have that going, you can then create a machine of, hey, I have this lens that I look through to identify the right company. And you can start hiring help, whether that's virtual assistants, someone in-house, a firm like ours they have something repeatable that they can always be going after. And you have this 
uh, you know, it's like conducting experiment, right? You want to limit the number of variables. You have something that can be consistent and constant the entire time while you're plugging in new companies, new people that meet that, and you can refine the messaging. All of this seems like complete common sense, yet I've never really done this. Um, my issue <laughs> with doing this in medical device sales was probably that there was only probably 50, 60 potential customers each year that I could go after in that there was, say, 100 accounts and I would already had half of them kind of on board. So I perhaps didn't need to do this as in-depth as someone who was selling perhaps SaaS software to mid-size organizations. Uh, clearly, there are thousands of accounts to go after, so we need to drill down on this. But other than just that one distinction where it's uh, more applicable perhaps for some uh, individuals than others, why don't we do this? Why isn't this the starting point? Why isn't this the, why aren't we given or seemingly organizations that for the audience who email me and are asking about prospecting, why aren't they given a, a playbook of sorts with this at the top of it? Because it seems like real common sense. Yeah. I mean, it, a lot of this is common sense. So it's, it's hard for me to really take credit for very much when <laughs> I'm just telling you things that you already know that you should be doing, right? But the reason why people don't do it is one, I think it takes work, right? People are lazy for the most part, and you got a lot of other things that you're working on. But really, it starts at the top with leadership. And leadership gets a lot of pressure. So sales managers, um, VPs of sales, chief revenue officers, especially a SaaS company, you have a lot of pressure to hit quotas because your investors have invested millions of dollars and you need to hit your sales targets. So what that does is it puts you in a very scarcity mindset, very short-term thinking, we need to hit our sales numbers. There's nothing wrong with doing that along because you got to hit your numbers and you got to pay the bills and all that others and keep the, keep the lights on. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but also in tangent being like, hey, what can we do that's a little bit more intentional? So if nothing else, if the least you did was say, you know what, maybe I don't need to do these ideal client profiles. Maybe I just create a profile or a list of 100 companies that are my dream clients. These are the people that would have double the deal size of our average client. They really, really need what we have to offer, et cetera. And just focus on those 100 companies and think about what are the patterns in those companies, building the list, what, how would we approach this and use that as an experiment. And I, the thing that I've learned just in my sales career of just selling stuff for the last 10 or 11 years is that not all advice is great advice and stuff might not work for you. So just try it, like use that as a test. Test it with 100 companies that are your dream clients. And if that works, then start doing that and apply that to the rest of what you're doing. So Jason, you said a word here, which is five years ago, I would have called you a hippie or thrown some, ab not really, but I would have thrown some, some kind of abuse at you, even if it was just in my own thoughts when you, if I'd heard you say it. Now it's becoming more and more important to me as I'm selling the outer space of the podcast, as I'm gearing up to sell the sales school to uh, to the enterprise and to corporates on a, on a larger scale. And that word was um, being intentional. So again, a few years ago, I'd have been, well, it doesn't really mean anything, but now it is a focus for me. So what does being intentional about your prospecting mean to you? It's no different than like when you go to the gym, right? Like I lift weights and when I go to the gym, I don't just say, hey, I'm going to wait until I get there and then I'm going to do a little bit of chest, do a little bit of arms, do a little bit of legs. It's like, no, I have a routine that I go through on a weekly basis because I have very specific goals, right? I don't want my muscles to be out of balance, right? And a lot of people approach this like going to the gym and not having any idea what they're going to do except for the amount of time that they're going to spend there and they don't make any progress towards their goals of losing weight or building muscle or whatever. So being intentional is... It can be as small as taking a step back and saying, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to block off the first 30 minutes of every day and maybe start with one day. And I'm just going to remove distractions, not respond to emails, Slack messages, phone calls, anything like that. And I'm just going to be thoughtful about what I'm doing. And sometimes we're so much in the day to day, like in the weeds doing stuff. We don't think about how we're doing the things that we're doing and why we're doing them. And that's one of the most valuable things that you can do in sales or business is just like take a step back and think about, okay, this prospecting that I'm doing, if I was the prospect, how would I respond to this? We have to challenge ourselves to do this too, even though we're prospecting. And we got to think about if I was the prospect receiving this email, would I respond? And guess what? A lot of times the answer is no. 
But if you don't step back and, and say, hey, instead of sending all these emails and reaching out to all these people and running all these sales calls, let me think about how I'm doing this. If you don't actively block off time in your calendar to do that, it's just not going to happen. Love it. So there's two things here that um, essentially exactly what you said, I agree with. And just another way, perhaps I think about it. One is, I can't remember who said this. I think it's probably a famous quote that's been recycled, but that is to always try and keep the main thing, the main thing. Um, I think you described it as people get in the weeds. I'm like this because I have just my personality type. It is the entrepreneur personality type. It's the debate personality type. Um, if you look at the kind of Myers-Briggs testing, I like to change topic and change pace and change. I, I, I make a great um, leader of an organization because I can be high. Uh, I can have a, a vision on things and how an industry is moving and we can create projects and stop projects. But the reverse of that is I find it very difficult to stick to the main thing. So the main thing for the podcast is great content and growing the podcast. There, there is, it's no more complicated than that. It doesn't need prettier graphics. It doesn't need better audio at this point. Yet, I will still spend two hours pretty much every week trying to research the perfect graphics um, kind of overlays or whatever it is, or the latest kind of trend in, uh, in graphic design to try and make it 1% better on that front when I could spend that time getting more downloads bigger show, bigger guests. And it's a, it's a, it's a kind of flywheel approach to that. So, so two things here that I really took in when you, when you uh, kind of going through that, Jason was keep the main thing, the main thing. The other one is the gym example. I've never put these two together for prospecting, but this works perfectly. So I've been half assed training for years now. It's only now that in the past 12 months that I've been training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, relatively regularly, and getting battered three times a week by bigger, stronger blokes and occasionally bigger, stronger women. That I've gone, right, study, I need to get, you know, not, not perhaps leaner, but definitely stronger and kind of in shape. And there's a guy, I like his methodologies. He talks about intermittent fasting, and we won't kind of go in the weeds of all this, but he uses a term called, and you have to excuse my language, uh, both Jason and Sales Nation, he uses a term called fuck arounditis. He says, this is the disease that plagues most gyms. Most gyms most, uh, are full of people who will do 10 minutes on a treadmill, as you described. And then they'll they'll do arms in some random exercise that doesn't do anything. Then they'll do something else. When all most people have to do is squat, bench, overhead press, and then probably get out of there, unless you're you know, training for a specific sport. That's all you need. Do that, eat more, and you'll put on weight. It's as simple as that. And he, he uses the, the term fuck around itis. And I feel like, this is 100% appropriate for prospecting because I've done it in the past. I was like, well, I'm going to do some today. I'm going to do some research. And then I forget about the research or I'll lose the spreadsheet that I've done it on. And then I just start sending these emails and I forgot about the, I, I've never tracked the messaging from any outreach I've done selling the advertising space on the podcast. I just recreate it every time. And I'm just mm -hmm. messing around. I'm not testing it appropriately. And so I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. And that, that just summed it up nicely. Um, yeah. Have you got any thoughts on that to, to add before we get onto the kind of the messaging side of the conversation? Jiu-Jitsu is a great example. I'm a huge fan of mixed martial arts and UFC and all that other stuff. And I haven't done Jiu-Jitsu, but I've done Muay Thai. But it's the same sort of thing. It's it's what you do on a daily basis that will actually get you the results that you want. You can't in one day get really good at Jiu-Jitsu, obviously, right? It takes months and years to do yeah. that. But it's you showing up every day with intentional effort that gets you the results that you want. Prospecting is the same exact thing. You have to make it daily and it has to be intentional and you gotta do it a long time and have faith in the process. I think where most people mess up, it's no different than going to the gym if we keep using that example. You gotta actually just sit down and think about what you're trying to accomplish and just put together a process for that. It doesn't have to be complicated. With prospecting, it's build an ideal client profile, find companies, Find contacts at those companies, build messaging, send messaging, rinse and repeat. You know, that's, it's just a five-step process. It's not that complicated. Yep. But if you don't approach it with that process and say, well, every morning, here's exactly what I'm going to do. I've already built my dream client list. I already have the companies that I want to reach out to. I already know the people. I'm going to send those emails. And maybe it's five personalized emails with videos per day. That's it. But you got to be intentional about doing that. And then obviously software, the right type of software is going to help you. A, B tests and keep things organized and all that good stuff. Sure. Well, we'll get onto tools uh, towards the end of the show, Jason, but say now we have, we've gone through step one of the process of building our ideal, and we could probably talk about this for four hours. So I, I, I appreciate we're glossing over some of this, but we've built our ideal customer profile using the impact, 
that we can have on the organization, whether we like working with them, um, whether they are repeat customers and, and the other things that we talked about at the top of the show. We've linked that with other organizations of um, company size. Do they serve the same customers? Um, are their customers' customers the same? And we can go down a, a funnel on that road. And, and there's tools that help us with this as well. So the next step seemingly then is the mess. And we've got all the contact details and there's plenty of tools that we shouldn't be doing this manually, right? There's plenty of tools that can give us contact details. So the next step seems to be the messaging. And, I, and, and focusing down on this word process, how do we create messaging that we know is going to bring predictability to the conversation, even if it's even if it's only predictable for six months and then we need to change it, how do we create somewhat predictable messaging? So you do have to make sure, I think the, the big mistake people make with messaging is think that, that like a one size fits all approach works. And it really has to, especially with the way things are moving, all the data shows that the number of like quality conversations per day is going down and the number of attempts to reach a prospect are going up. Any data that you look at is going to tell you that. So to stick through the clutter, things really need to be segmented. So before you create messaging, make sure that you not only have those ICPs created, but the, the people you're reaching out to, I recommend another thing. Um, have you heard of like selling above and below the line? Uh, it sounds familiar, but I couldn't define it for you. There's a book uh, called Selling Above and Below the Line by William Miller. And essentially what it is, he says, the above the line people at companies, C-level and VPs, have very different goals and challenges than below the line people you know, uh, directors, managers. And the reason for that is that above the line, they're typically focused on quarters and revenue and profit. Below the line is actively probably doing the thing that you could help them with and are more interested in how they can save time and improve productivity and make their job easier. So that's really important to know because both above the line and below the line might have just as much influence on hiring your company. So when you approach the messaging, you got to think about well, who am I sending this to? Is it a decision maker that's above the line or below the line? So that's the first step. Second step, there's a couple different things that I recommend doing with the persona exercise. And this is, so there's a lot of different ways you can approach this, but the way that I like to think about this is the person I'm reaching out to, what is this person's responsibilities and higher level objectives? So what are they trying to accomplish? Are they pushing revenue? Are they managing salespeople? Whatever it might be. And then I look at what are they trying to accomplish? So their goals, their obstacles that are keeping them from doing that and any fears that they might have associated. So goals, fears, obstacles. And the way that you approach the messaging and the way a sales cadence, so a sales cadence is a sequence of messages um, that you would send to a prospect. The way that that would work is it would be set up like this. So you would want the copy to address goals, fears, and obstacles. You also want to make sure that you're not making the assumption that the prospect already knows that they have a challenge or problem. So in other words, make sure that you approach this from an educational standpoint. So the first outreach I send, that first email, is more of a here's who I am and here's why I'm reaching out and some sort of social proof. So if I'm selling prospecting solutions to a SaaS company, for example, I have some sort of personalization, either a video or a couple sentences. But I'd say, uh, hey, I'm, I'm reaching out because what we do at Blissful Prospecting is we help SaaS companies like yours remove the stress from prospecting. And what we do is we help them get the attention of the clients they're trying to work with. I'm not sure if that's a challenge you're having right now, but if it is, you might find this resource helpful. P.S. We've worked with this company, this company, and this company. Here's a case study if you want to check it out. That's that's what the first sort of outreach feels like. From there. I'm going to start making sure that the rest of the cadence addresses fears that this person might have, not hitting their sales quota, salespeople quitting on them, not getting the attention of their dream clients, whatever it is, I'm addressing those. And hopefully I have a content piece, you know, which is great. Like what you like, you have awesome content right in your podcast. Like I would be sharing specific things and snippets. Like one of the things I love about your content is you do those like three to five minute recaps where it's like a specific topic with like four or five different mm -hmm. guests. Like that would be a really great example if you had, like if I had that for prospecting, I would share something like that. Like, by the way, here's some really awesome tips from, you know, some people that really know what they're talking about. I thought you might enjoy this. And it's addressing those goals, fears, and obstacles. And then from there, you got to make sure to have uh, some sort of empathy in there. And I've already kind of been doing that. It's just, 
show empathy and, and like, hey, I, I understand you're probably feeling like a lot of pressure to hit your quotas and things like that. So I'm hoping that this resource will make that a little bit easier. Are you interested in chatting about how we might be able to help you out? So that's kind of getting started. Is there any, I'm sure there's a lot of <laughs> places that you want to dig into deeper, but that's that's sort of how we approach getting started. Is the goal with this then, because that's the formula of a of a marketing funnel or campaign, not mm -hmm. necessarily potentially what a traditional sales, well, traditional kind of sales cadence is, can, will you speak to me? Will you speak to me? I'm going to voicemail you. Will you speak to me? And then you text them and then you email them and then you kind of, you just keep spamming them with random nonsense. That's how most salespeople do it, uh, myself included. So this is the this is a what we're talking about here is a, a formulaic approach to almost build momentum throughout these emails. So are we expecting a reply on, or are we hoping for a reply on the first email, or are we expecting that we're only going to get a reply on on the third or fourth after we've had that cadence with them? So this is totally dependent on the industry, and I. Wish I could give a stock answer there, but it depends on the industry and who you're reaching out to. So what we've seen that's very common is if we have a messaging cadence that's really, really dialed in and we have something that's really repeatable, we'll get a response in the first or second email, interested or not interested. That's less common. And in most cases, it's emails or outreach four to six is where we're getting most of the feedback, yes or no. The big thing, and I want to comment on what you said about this is different than like the sales approach where it's like, Hey, are you interested in talking? No, no, no. It's like a murder by numbers game. Um, you got to be aware of like, there's a lot of great studies on this and a lot of great content out there on the B2B buyer's journey. And everyone talks about it a little bit different, but essentially the first three steps are awareness, consideration, and interest. So awareness, you have to create awareness around a challenge to get them to consider what the solution might be and that you might be the company and get them interested in talking to you. You can't start at the very end and assume that they're already interested and know who you are. Otherwise, you're just you're, you're literally spamming them. You're not taking any time to get to know them. And guess what? 90, probably 99% of your competition is doing the same exact thing. So you don't stick out from anyone else. And this is, because I want to kind of wrap up the show talking about video, but this is a, a true way to differentiate yourself, right? And I get emails every day from people saying, well, you know, my product is somewhat commoditized. Maybe it's, maybe it's a fantastic product. Perhaps we're talking about CRM and there's a million different CRMs. There's Salesforce at the top. There's perhaps HubSpot because Salesforce cover everything because they just acquire any company that's doing anything. And there's obviously strategy behind that. It's a, it's a platform. There's perhaps then HubSpot for small to medium-sized enterprises, which dominate that market. And then there's an, an incredible amount of different companies underneath that. And so if you're selling for one of those organizations, everyone's marketing bullet points will have some kind of differentiation, but it's all to the end user pretty much the same. So reaching out in a different way to everyone else is, I feel, and tell me if your thoughts on this, Jason, but that might be a key differentiator in getting the deal done. Yeah, it, it could be. It could be one of the things. And like CRMs, for example, I think is a great, it's a great example to use because it's in a, a red ocean, right? Uh, everyone knows what a CRM is. The company you're reaching out to is probably already using a CRM. And you don't need to really over explain and educate on what a CRM is. But what you need to have in that cadence is, you know, for example, I mean, there's lots of tools you can figure out if someone's using Salesforce or HubSpot especially HubSpot, because it's a marketing tool. It's going to be embedded into the code of their website. Why don't you call that out in the email? Hey, I, I noticed that you're using HubSpot. Uh, here are a, supple, uh, a couple of customers that we're working with right now that switched from HubSpot to Pipedrive, if, if I'm Pipedrive. Um, and the reason for that was this. Are you having any sorts of challenges like that? Uh, are you open to talking about them? Or would you be open to a quick demo? Or could I record a quick demo video, a personalized demo for you? Or if I recorded a personalized demo, would you watch it? You know, like that's the type of way that you can start a conversation. So two things here. One, just for anyone who isn't sure, can you explain super briefly what the difference between a, a blue ocean strategy is versus uh, going into the red ocean? So blue ocean is an example of that actually is when we started Blissful Prospecting, a lot of my background has been in, in marketing and sales. So I was like, well, let's start a marketing agency. And the blue ocean strategy there was, well, there's thousands of marketing agencies. If we want to work with marketing agencies as partners and also differentiate ourselves from them, if we brand ourselves and position ourselves as a prospecting company, 
it's a little bit more of a blue ocean strategy. And when we started Blissful Prospecting, I could make that case. Now it's a little harder because a lot of companies are doing prospecting. Red Ocean is you're selling something that's highly commoditized. Everyone already knows exactly what it is. And you can't really position yourself as something that's different because in the prospect size, you do the same exact thing everyone else does. Perfect. And then one thing that you mentioned here, which I'm starting to cover more, I've actually done a few shows on it in the past couple of weeks, and it's starting to become more and more of a kind of an imperative for us to cover because I feel like we've totally neglected it. And this goes for prospecting, doubling down on this more than anything else. How little, how, how, how can I frame this? So you talk about getting someone to switch from or discuss switching from one competitor to another. How little or how much more time should we be spending focused on getting converting accounts versus going after brand new accounts in the context of someone who's already spending money is already pre-qualified, right? They may be spending more money. They may be spending less than what you'd be charging. There's, there's plenty of opportunity to get in. You can suss all this out. There's been a purchase in the past. So there's been a buying process put in place. There's people who are perhaps happy and unhappy. It's, it, for me, it's the best accounts to go after. And most large enterprise accounts will have whatever you are trying to sell them already. So this kind of goes double down for them. How important is it to prospect those accounts versus what I feel what most people do is they go after accounts that are brand new and need educating from the, the, from the very get-go of all of this? Yeah, this is why it's important to segment your prospecting outreach. So if you're going to really get serious about prospecting, I would probably save 20% of your outreach for those dream clients that are those enterprise companies that it might take six plus months or more to, to sell this company. But if you sell them, this could be a huge account, right? And it could be huge social proof for you. I'd probably make that about 20%. And you're going to do extra stuff for them. You're going to do extra personalization. You're going to send these like videos. You might send direct mailers, et cetera. The majority of your prospecting though, you kind of want to be in this middle range of probably mid-market companies that may or may not already be using your solution, but are going to understand what it is. And you're not going to have to deal with a really, really long sales cycle because one of the most uh, disheartening things about prospecting is having to wait six to 12 months in order for it to work. <laughs> so I think it's I really feel important. Like there was a downturn in your voice then of your, your kind of own like realization of this of like, Oh, it does take 12 months for this to work. And the whole, everyone listening as well, Jason went, Oh, it does take 12 months. But that's, that's sobering, right? Yeah. And the thing is, is if you, if you, if you can find that middle market, and again, this requires testing with your ideal client profile and it depends on what you're selling, right? With sales cycles and stuff, but you can, you could find people that you could start working with in one to three months, right? Uh, a sales cycle versus these enterprise companies. And, and it depends on what your company is and like what you're selling. So, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but what I would really do is segment the outreach. Don't treat every prospect exactly the same. I think that is a, a good way to kind of wrap up this part of the show, Jason. And that's what I'm taking away from it. Of I don't think marketers, and you, you'll know this from your background in marketing, marketers segment everything. And they are trying to become salespeople eventually with the use of, of chatbots, with the use of just mass data. At some point, it'll be somewhat difficult if someone's just spamming cold outreach and not really making that much of an effort as a human salesperson a marketing email is going to do almost as good a job, if not a better job eventually over time. So we need to differentiate ourselves. And I think us sub, sub segmenting into smaller groups than perhaps what even marketing does is the way we can go about that. Um, but one final thing that I want to wrap up the show with, uh, Jason, is, is video emails because you reached out to me with video email. It got my attention and I'm seeing it more and more frequently when I'm doing different bits of prospecting, when I'm uh, selling out space on the show, wherever, um, as we're gearing up to start selling the sales school to the enterprise and different things, I'm experimenting with all kinds of different emails or texts or just cold calls or adding someone on LinkedIn and then messaging them on LinkedIn and then following them on Twitter and doing all this nonsense social selling stuff, which may or may not work depending on kind of, uh, your, your how in depth you want to go with it all. The thing that is working right now for me is just sending a quick video from the studio. So not everyone has this, and this adds social proof. It adds credibility uh, and different elements to um, the video itself. Because when someone gets a video from this, they go, oh, this this dude isn't messing around with his podcast. Clearly, it's a kind of a full-time venture. With that said, 
why is video so useful and why is it, I would say, and I won't put words in your mouth, but probably the best way to reach out to people right now in 2019? Uh, the reason for that is that, you know, growth hackers and salespeople and all this other stuff, like once they find an email template that works, what do they do? They write a blog post about it, especially if you're one of these email service uh, providers that has cold email software. So what happens is people start regurgitating the same exact templates and people are sending all of these things. And when you look at the tech stack that a company uses for prospecting, if you're just doing email, you're doing what like 85, 90% of your competition is doing. If you're just doing LinkedIn, which is starting growth hackers are kind of, and I'd throw myself into this category too, uh, we're kind of, kind of ruining LinkedIn right now. You're probably getting a lot of cold messages that might have the first name personalized in there more so than you were getting a year ago. So it's becoming less effective because you're not, you're getting more people that you don't know requesting to talk to you using the same exact outreach. So the reason why video is important is that you can't fake a personalized video. You really cannot. And one of the things that it allows you to do in an email that I really like is like the email that I sent to you in the thumbnail, I was holding a little whiteboard or a piece of paper and it had hi your name on it. So you see that thumbnail in the video and you're like, okay, clearly this looks personalized. From there, what I can do too, and why I think this is so powerful for you with video and why this is working, is that people can see you, they can see your personality, they can see and determine, even if it's subconscious, if you're a credible person and if you would relate to them and if they would enjoy talking to you. So video allows the prospect to actually empathize with you. And I think that word empathy is something that I've really learned, Sarah and I have learned the hard way with our prospecting campaigns, is that, that we weren't putting enough empathy in there and allowing the other person to put themselves in our shoes or to look at us and be like, would I want to work with this person? When you're hiding behind the text of an email, unless you're a, a very, very, very talented copywriter, your personality is not coming across. A video is a really easy way to do that. It's a really easy way to show that you did your research. And we have tools now that make it really, really easy to plug it into an email. I think that video a year or two from now is going to become the minimum expectation uh, to get someone to respond. I agree. And I literally did a video yesterday. Um, one of the regular sponsors of the show, I won't name who it is, just in case the kind of deal doesn't come through. But I'm trying to build a, a center basic sent over proposal for them. I want to work with them on a new podcast, a new kind of feed that we're doing, uh, sales leadership salesleadership.org. It's essentially everything that we're doing on the Salesman Podcast, but for sales leaders. And so I reached out to them, sent them a proposal, and then I followed up with an email um, with a video in it created by Soapbox. And I'll ask you kind of your thoughts and opinions on the best software for creating these videos in a second. But with Soapbox, you can go from just the webcam to then the screen and then your face on the screen, uh, your, your webcam alongside the screen content as well. So all I did was just basically go through the proposal as if I would, if I was sat next to that individual and just say, okay, so this is this, this is this, this is why um, X, Y, Z is here. This is why there's two tiers, um, basically due to the, the fact that your quarter ends on a different quarter than ours. So you might want to kind of budget one side and budget the other, but to put that in an email, it'd be about 15,000 words and no one would ever read it. It'd be, <laughs> it'd be boring as heck. Cause, and especially when yeah. you're talking about contracts or um, you know, pr proposals of, of 12 months worth of work, I feel like if someone's written down in an email, it's got to be documented. It's going to be shared around. If you're using creative copy at that point, it might not look as professional um, on, on kind of page, but over video, you can be yourself and you can use not slang and colloquialisms, but you can be more relaxed about the language that you're using versus how it's documented if it's going to be shared around. And I've seen that that video has been shared 15 times well, before I clicked record it with, with you today, Jason, it's been shared kind of 15 plus times in the past 24 hours. So that video has, uh, clearly has virality in itself, again, versus going, you know, Pam, can you can you read through this 15 page document and tell me your thoughts on it? It's Pam, can you watch this two and a half minute video and and give me your thoughts and if this is a, is a goer or not, and hopefully it's going to be a goer. So with that said, Jason, is video, where does video come in the cadence is what I'm getting at here. Is the first email video, then the second email's video, and there's a video the whole way, or is there a quick introduction just to get attention via text, and then we get into video when we know the individual has been opening the emails so that we can kind of lower the amount of work we've got to do on the video front, 
how do we frame all this up in our sales cadence? Mm -hmm. Great question. And I want to quickly comment on what you said too, that video is so underutilized in the sales process as well. And the reason why it's so powerful is oftentimes the person, if you're selling in a digital world like we are, where you hop on a Zoom call with someone, the person you interacted with is likely not going to be the only person that has decision-making uh, that's going to contribute to the decision-making process. So if you have a video, the other person that needs to like help them make the decision, which might be their boss, if they see you and your personality, that might be all that they need to pull the trigger. So just keep that in mind. Make it easy for them to have a conversation outside of the sales call. So you asked a really interesting question. And this is something where we do a lot of experimenting with. So where I would start is I would, it obviously depends on how much time you have. And most of us don't have enough time. So you really want to 80-20 and prioritize this. So what I would do is your dream client list. So that 100 companies that you're like, hey, if I landed this company, this would be like a total game changer for, for me as a salesperson or for my business, I would start out with a video. So for us, like getting on podcasts is like a really big deal right now. And you have a great podcast in a, in a, in a huge platform for, especially for this space. So I want to send a video on the very first outreach so that I can make a good first impression because that might be the only impression I get to, to give you, right? So segmenting those dream clients, I would start out videos with them. And then the rest, what I would do is prioritize that based on engagement. So with tools, you have a, it's really easy to see if people are opening emails. If you have click tracking on, if that's something you do, you can do that too. And you can say, hey, I sent out 100 emails last week. 40, 50% of the people opened them. These are the people that are highest engaged, that open the most, click on the most links. I'm going to send personalized videos to these 10 or 15 people that already got a couple of emails from me. I'm going to throw it right into the middle of the cadence. That's more often case of the times how we do it. That makes total sense. And again, and we'll wrap up with this. What's the context of the video with regards to, is it 30 seconds? Is it five minutes? What's the, if you're experimenting on, on all of this, are we just regurgitating what we would say in an email anyway, or are we using a video in a slightly different manner? Yeah, this is something, I'll tell you what's working for us, but again, it's test it yourself and it's going to be industry specific. So good rule of thumb though, is keep it around 30 seconds. And the reason for that is they don't know who you are. People have really short attention spans. And if you're going to ask for more than 30 seconds of their time, it's just too big of an ask. So the way that we do videos and what we say is it could be something like this, say, uh, you know, hey, Will, this is Jason with Blissful Prospecting. Uh, first off, I want to say I'm a big fan of your podcast. I listened to this episode with Jeffrey Gittimer and got this out of it. The um, reason I was reaching out is I thought that if you're looking for guests, we could talk about video prospecting, how that's working for us, how that might work for your, for your audience, and how that might be valuable for them. And then give some times to talk and then say, hey, look at the email, and then that's it. Um, 30 seconds, keep it real short. Who are you? Why are you reaching out? One or two sentences, like your value prop, how you can help the person and why you want to chat, and then have a call to action. Keep it very short and sweet. And I try not to be too wordy, smile, you know, all those good stuff. And I'll tell you what I got from the video that you sent over directly. We've not, for the audience, we've not kind of discussed this before the show, but I got that you were calm, collected, clearly um, comfortable in front of the camera and on the mic, which is a huge positive because it's otherwise I've got to, I'll have people on who aren't comfortable in front of the mic, but I typically have to coach them for five, 10, 15 minutes before the show and, and kind of it makes my life not, well, it makes my life harder, but it's, it's, you know, it's sometimes that it's worth the, the effort of doing that. So I was like, right. Interesting. Um, the, I, you said something, I can't remember what it was specifically now on the spot, but you said something that I was like, that is interesting. And then it, it all kind of tied it all together. I was like, oh, this, this person isn't, you know, don't, and this is a, this is a huge compliment. This person isn't an idiot. Cause I get so many people reaching out to me that have wrote some kind of nonsense ebook and then, you know, are spamming all these different podcasts just to get some kind of attention. And I've met, I've learned this my lesson in the past of having these people on, and then there's no, there's no depth to the conversation, but just to be able to get on video and be happy and confident and smile. And, and that is, I don't know whether it's, maybe I'm overthinking it, but that is probably where your gut feeling comes from where you go, Oh, I can probably trust this person. There's an, there's elements of trust to all of this and rapport building, which you just can't get over for, for a text email. Right. 
you know, and trust, that word is so important in sales. Everything is based on trust. It's trust in you, trust in your product or service, and trust in the company. And you can get a lot of those things taken care of in a 30-second video if you do it right. Yeah. And you can get it wrong, just uh, for context. I do get occasional emails <laughs> yeah. where I go, that person is an idiot. And I thank them for the time, thank them for the video and say, you know, this is the appropriate time for to have you on the show or whatever, whatever the uh, nonsense excuse that I give them is. So with that, Jason, and uh, just for context of the audience, that it can be done badly. <laughs> we, we do need to think about this before we start spamming videos out 24-7 to individuals uh, that we want to be in front of. With that, Jason, I've got one final question, mate, to ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him that help him become better at selling? I would say the biggest thing is making sure to have more of my style and personality in the approach. I think when you're getting started, you need a foundation of some sort. So you start, you read books and you listen to podcasts and you watch YouTube videos and you're like, I want to be like this person. I want to be like Gary Vee or Grant Cardone or Jeffrey Gittimer or all the other people that we've been talking about instead of, you know, I really like what they're doing, but how can I do this for myself so that I can be authentic? Because when you, people can smell uh, desperation or inauthenticity, if that's a word, yep. uh, <laughs> uh, from a mile away. And they can see it in your body language. It comes out in your voice. And if you just really own the process and be like, you know, I get that there's con like conceptually, I need to do these things in order to make a sale, but how can I make this mine and make it my own? I wish I would have done that much, much earlier on in my sales career. How did you come to that realization? And then what did you read, do, uh, develop or work on to come up with a style? Because a style is important, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that really owning, like for me, an interesting thing was I thought all salespeople, like successful salespeople had to have the gift of gab, you know, be able to play like good talkers. Because I came from a background where my parents aren't in sales, right? They aren't in business. They don't run businesses. None of my family really does that. So I didn't even know what sales was before college. And the misconception I had in my head and the fear I had is that I know I'm not an extroverted person. I'm not a person that's going to go to a networking event and like really get a lot of energy from that and really be able to talk to people. I'm a great listener and I can ask great questions. And I think owning my introvertedness and really owning the fact that the best salespeople actually are the people that are the best listeners and ask the best questions. You don't have to be a good talker. I don't know exactly when I made that realization, but I started reading a lot of books about people that are introverted and like studying people that had more of an introverted style and approach to selling. And that just really, really clicked with me that I can be myself and that's what people appreciate most. I think one pro tip that I would give is I always ask people, I did this, so I ran a house painting business in college. And as a freshman in college, one thing that I did always after someone gave me a sales, I asked them, you know, if you don't mind me asking, why did you decide to hire me today? And what they would tell me was way different than what I thought. I thought that they were going to say, you seem really experienced. We loved your sales pitch. The price was right. They're like, no, I, I just really liked you. Yeah. I trust you. And I heard that over and over and over again. I'm like, you know what? It's not about the pitch. It's not about me having the best price. I was selling house painting services and I never even painted a house myself before. And I wasn't doing the painting. I'd, I'd hire painters, but that was the big realization I had that people hire me because they, they like me and I can really own that. And that's going to work well because it's authentic and people want to work with people that are authentic and genuine. I won more business in my medical device sales job from just being not the traditional salesperson than pretty much anything else. And it was only by... Uh, naivety that I didn't know what I should have been doing that I just started down <laughs> that that route but in medical devices in the role I was in two massive companies I worked for both of them at different times and they both had their own stereotypes one company they hired the last company I worked for they had mainly ex-athletes and professional athletes that you know didn't quite make it into the the Premier League here in the UK or didn't quite make it to the to Saints rugby team or whatever it was so they were driven they were kind of aggressive they were assertive I did not fit in that crowd whatsoever the other company is a Japanese company. They follow all the Japanese principles of business of kind of 1% improvement and, and Kaizen and all that side of things. They're all a bit soft, weak, and no, weak's not the right word, but a bit soft and wet and kind of, we're just going to do this and this, and there wasn't any flexibility. I didn't quite, I kind of didn't fit in with Eva. I, I kind of found my place in the middle. And with all that said, when I learned to just be myself and not try and 
fit in with everyone else in one organization or fit in with everyone else in the other. People would start commenting on, oh, we're not having that jerk from your competitors in because he was, you know, he was being dead aggressive on the phone and was pushing for this or that. And then you have it from the flip side of, um, we're not having that person in from that organization because they were just slow, monotonous. They couldn't just give us um, medical equipment on loan. They had to go for all the paperwork, which, you know, we, we should all go for the paperwork from it, but sometimes you'd help people out where, where appropriate. And I was, as I said, I was always in the middle and I got more compliments of, I would just rather have you in the theater with me whilst we're using the gear than the competition. Not, not that you're better at sales or you're better serving us or anything else. It was just like, you know, you could be a laugh and it's nice having you around. And, um, and that was pretty much it. And that was the feedback I got forever. Every sales role I've ever done. And it's not that I'm a, you know, I'm a better person than anyone else I was competing with or I was funny or anything else. I think I was just, I was probably just, <laughs> this is really bad. I was probably just neutral. I was probably just kind of acceptable to have in the room with people. And as I said, that, yeah. that was my competitive advantage in, in a lot of occasions. Um, so yeah, so there's just being yourself is, is just so important, right? Yeah, because at the end of the day, even though we're doing business to business sales, you're selling to a person. This person has individual fears, stuff that they're self-conscious about, things that they like in people, et cetera. At the end of the day, you just got to be relatable. Like actually take the time to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Be likable, be relatable, be genuine. Love it. Well, with that, tell us a little bit about blissful prospecting. And then you've got a link to share with us as well. Definitely. Um, so I put together a guide uh, for your audience on how to get started with uh, video prospecting in less than five minutes. So it's got the tool that I recommend, a process flow to follow steps A through Z to do it, and then also a script of what to say. Uh, you can get that at blissfulprospecting.com slash salesman. And what we do at Blissful Prospecting is we essentially remove the stress from prospecting by doing this for you. So we do everything up to the point of that introductory call. So we'll help you build out those ICPs, get the accounts for you, mine the contacts, create the messaging, help you send out the videos. And we specialize in doing that for typically small and, and medium-sized organizations where the founder is either really engaged in sales or you might be a quota-carrying salesperson yourself and, and need a little bit of help hitting your quota or your team might, and we can help you out there. Amazing stuff. Well, I'll link to that, Blissful Prospecting, everything else uh, we've talked about. I think we've mentioned a couple of books in this episode. I'll link to all that in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, Jason, I genuinely enjoyed today's conversation. It went it went as, as well as what I thought it could have done from the initial video that you sent me. So with that, mate, I want to thank you for your time, your insights on all of this, specifically on segmentation and specifically on your ideal customer or client profile. I think that's really profound and useful for the audience. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thanks for having me on. This is a lot of fun.